Trouble with Black, Black Boys by Pedro A. Nogiera. Carrying on. Sadly, part of what Gunier and other parents must prepare their black sons for is the prospect and even the possibility that the group he most likely to experience conflict and hostility with is not the police or the Ku Klux Klan, but other black males. For reasons that can never be fully explained, black males kill and harm one another at a rate that far exceeds any other segment of the American population. The alarming homicide rates among young black males is one of the major factors that has led to black males being the only segment of the U.S. population with a declining life expectancy. Gangs, drug dealing, and the availability of guns are certainly contributing factors, but there's more going on related to the phenomenon of violence among and between black males that defies easy explanation. I once found myself in the middle of a heated argument that nearly erupted into violence between black men over nothing more than a basketball game. At the time, I was a professor at Harvard University living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and as was my custom, I went to play basketball at a court where men... My age, roughly between 30 and 45, played ball on Saturday mornings. Most of the men playing were employed, some like me as professionals, and most were husbands and fathers with children. This is a typical pickup game of street ball, an informal form of recreation with no uniform or referees. Teams are chosen just before the start of the game, and nothing is at stake. No one is getting paid. It really does not matter who wins or loses, and there are no spectators present to impress other than the men waiting to play next. One morning during a game that was becoming particularly intense, two players who had been engaged in friendly banter over who was the better player, began arguing over how closely and aggressively they were guarding each other. Finally, one player took a hard fall to the ground after a flagrant, flagrant foul by the other player, and the two men began posturing as if they were about to fight. After cursing, yelling, and exchanging threats with each other for several minutes, a few other men joined the fray, some attempting to make peace so that we could get on with the game, while others egged, or agged, I'm not, egged, it looks like egged, but I think it's agged, while others agged on the two as they hoped a fight between the two men might actually erupt. As the threats and arguing escalated, one man announced that he was going to his car to get his gun, at which point several of the other men and I left the court with great haste. On my drive home, I asked myself why grown men with so much to lose, families, jobs, reputations were threatening to kill each other over a basketball game. I, although no one was actually killed that morning, the fact that threats of death were exchanged over something so trivial suggested something profound was going on. As I thought about it, I realized that the incident made no sense by considering only what was happening on the court, so I thought about the lives of these black men beyond the court, the pressures they experience in their jobs, the scrutiny they endure, and the many contexts and situations, the burden so many bear to prove their competence and worthiness, and the mask of aggression that many black men feel compared to, uh, compelled to don as a method of warding off threats on the street. I then understood that this fight over basketball is emblematic of a much, large, much larger phenomenon. Several researchers have found that the pressures of black men and boys experience exact the toll on our their psychological emotional well-being how they respond to these pressures is undoubtedly a factor that contributes to the high rate of interpersonal violence between and among black males and is also the reason that it is so important that the challenges confronting black males need not be framed in ways that characterize them as helpless victims trouble begins at school sadly the pressure stereotypes and patterns of failure that black males experience often begin in school i say sadly because we might hope even expect that School would be a place where black males are nurtured and supported, where they receive encouragement to excel and guidance on how to achieve their goals and dreams. Yet for many black males, the opposite is true. Throughout the United States, black males are more likely than any other group in American society to be punished, typically through some form of exclusion, labeled and categorized for special education, often without an apparent disability, and to experience academic failure. The existence of such patterns does not mean that black male students are innocent victims of unfair treatment, but it does raise the possibility that in schools throughout the United States, the failure of black males it's so pervasive that it appears to be the norm, and so does not raise alarm. Raise alarms. School discipline patterns are just one of several troubling indicators commonly associated with black males. When the full picture of educational performance among black males are analyzed, the results are even more disturbing. On every indicator associated with progress and achievement, enrollment in honors courses, advanced placement, and gifted programs, black males are vastly underrepresented. And in every category associated with failure and distress, discipline referrals, dropout rates, grade retention, black males are overrepresented. In what is perhaps the most ominous and obvious sign of distress for the past several years, there have been more black males between the ages of 18 and 24 in prison than in college. Such patterns of failure. Wow. The past several years have been more black males between the ages of 18 and 24 in prison than in college. Such patterns of failure and hardship are so pronounced and entrenched that they end up shaping adult outcomes and have broadened far-reaching implications for the status of black men and black people in American society. 
what perhaps is even more troubling than the numbers which are themselves overwhelming and disturbing is the weakness of the response to these problems. In many schools in the United States, educators have grown so accustomed to seeing black male students drop out, fail, and get punished that their plight is barely regarded as a cause for alarm. In fact, it could be argued that the problem confronting black males are so pervasive and commonplace that they have been normalized. Like other social problems have been normalized, attitudes towards the homeless or society's tolerance for the large number of people who lack access to adequate health care. A sense of complacency characterizes how many Americans think about the failure of black males. Because the educational problems afflicting black males have been normalized, the barrage of dismal statistics barely registers a sense of outrage or concern with the notable exception of many black communities. Where the problems confronting black males regarded as an American problem, meaning an issue like cancer or global warming that must be taken on by the entire society in order to be addressed apply to black males would be a subject that policymakers and research centers would embrace in an effort to find ways to reduce and ameliorate the hardships. Although there have been calls for urgent action of this kind, it's hard to argue that recognition of the need to address this pressing problem is widespread. This is why the mass incarceration of black males, black males comprise <coughs> Approximately 50% of the adult male prop population has elicited calls for action to reverse these trends. It's called the New Jim Crow. So before they would, uh, white people could just lynch black people whenever they felt like it. Now they put them through the criminal justice system and they um, either uh, lynch them on the electric chair or uh, put them in prison and make them their slaves again. It's the New Jim Crow. Black males are 10 times more likely to be incarcerated than any other segment of the U.S. population, but little public concern is expressed about the impact this problem has on black families or black men themselves. Although the majority of men behind bars are there for nonviolent crimes, and although a substantial number of those we incarcerate are poor, uneducated, and mentally disabled, very little public concern has registered over the injustices of the criminal justice system. Today, there are few serious calls for alternatives to incarceration, even for the aged or the drug addicted, and surprisingly little focus on what might be done to educate and re rehabilitate those who are warehoused in our nation's prisons. In public schools, the normalization of failure on the part of black males is equally per pervasive. This is undoubtedly because many of the educators have grown accustomed to the idea that a large percentage of the black male students they serve will fail, get in trouble, or drop out of school. Such complacency is present not only in large urban school systems where it can be argued that failure for many different kinds of students, boys and girls of various races, has long been accepted, but in more affluent suburban schools as well. Not long ago, I was leading on a workshop on the achievement gap for principals in an affluent school district. I presented a set of strategies that I suggested could be used to address lagging achievement among certain groups of students. At the end of the presentation, I encouraged the principals to do more to address the blatant ways in which students were denied learning opportunities through what I described as structural indifference. During the discussion that followed, one of the principals posed what I felt was a fairly provocative question. He explained that he had recently been hired by the district and was still becoming familiar with his school. One of the things about the school they did not understand was why he consistently observed a large group of black males loitering in the hallways after the bell that had rung. He had made efforts to encourage them to get up to class on time. Yet he felt that they were deliberately taking their time and that teachers and administrators at the school seemed to ignore their lingering. Disturbed by their apparent intransigence and curious about what they might be going, he decided to follow them to their destination. After chatting ca casually about the importance of being in class on time, he was surprised to find that all the young men of this group were descending to the basement of the school. When asked why they were going to the basement, he explained that the special education classes were located there. With a note of sarcasm in his book, he asked, Do you think they'd be... they?" that maybe they're embarrassed to be seen headed into the basement? Do you think it would be a good idea to take those classes out of the basement? Um, yeah. The Trouble with Black Boys. Okay, so the crux of the book in the introduction. The trouble with black boys is that too often they're assumed to be at risk because they're too aggressive, too loud, too violent, too dumb, too hard to control, too streetwise, and too focused on sports. Such assumptions and projections have the effect of fostering the very behaviors and attitudes we find problematic and objectionable. The trouble with black boys is that most never have a chance to be thought of as potentially smart and talented or to dis demonstrate talents in science, music, or literature. The trouble with black boys is that too often they are placed in schools where their needs for nurturing, support, and loving discipline are not met. Instead, they're labeled, shunned, and treated in ways that create and reinforce an inevitable cycle of failure. I was reminded of just how unsupported some educators can be towards black male students when I was visiting, visiting an elementary school in the San Francisco Bay Area. At the assistant principal gave me a tour and proudly pointed out the new library and computer facilities. He shook his head with disgust as he noticed a little boy waiting for him outside his office. Seeing the boy, he turned to me and declared, you know, there's a prison cell in San Quentin waiting for that boy. I responded with a shock. Really? 
How do you know? He explained that the boy's father and brother were in prison and then prophesied, I could tell by the way that he behaves, that he's headed to prison too. I then looked at him and asked, well, given what you know about this boy and his circumstances at home, what is the school doing to keep him out of prison? The assistant principal reacted to my question with incredulity. Incredulity. He explained that the boy was frequently in trouble and that what he was about to do was to place the boy only eight years old and on an extended and indefinite suspension. Due to his misbehavior in school, he's going to be sent home where he would be under the supervision of a sick grandmother. His schoolwork was to be delivered to his house and collected at the end of the week until they felt he was ready to return to school. I asked the assistant principal if he thought this strategy would help the child, and he responded by saying that he is more concerned about the students who want to learn. He elaborated that a child like this needs more attention than we could provide. I can't allow one kid to take up so much time that I end up ignoring the needs of others. Though he didn't admit it, admit it the assistant principal is in effect washing his hands of this boy and allowing him to head on the path to prison just as he had predicted. What I find troubling, troubling about this indictment is that the assistant principal never considered the possibility that the school or even the community might be able to do something to help this boy in their by reduce the likelihood that he would one day end up in prison. Perhaps even more disturbing, the assistant principal was a black man. I did not make light of the difficulty in addressing the needs of troubled students. Children who come from homes without adequate supervision, guidance, and support pose a tremendous challenge to the educators charged with serving their academic needs. I also do not take the position that schools should be expected to solve these problems by themselves. Charged with the task of educating disadvantaged and neglected children, many educators find themselves overwhelmed by their needs, many of which have little to do with academic learning, but are much more related to their health, unmet social needs, and emotional well-being. In cities, towns, trailer parks, and housing projects, uh, projects across the United States are a growing number of children in such circumstances. If our society is to find ways to reduce the numbers who end up permanently unemployed, incarcerated, or prematurely dead, we must do more to address their needs, especially while they're young. I fully acknowledge that black males are not helpless victims in this situation. In fact, it is my contention that the only way we will begin to break the cycle of failure is if black males are empowered and engaged in addressing these issues themselves. To not acknowledge that black males have the capacity to make choices that will positively affect their lives, to study, work hard, not take drugs, or not abuse women to support their children and raise their families in a responsible manner is merely another way of inadvertently contributing to the marginalization and powerlessness. Certainly there are many factors that black males do not control that have tremendous bearing on the quality of their lives, the quality of the school they attend, the kind of neighborhood they live in, whether there are jobs available or employers who will hire them, whether police officers will stop them without justification or judges will treat them fairly, or even if they will be born healthy and raised in loving, supportive families. Nonetheless, there are factors that can and must be must exercise control over. This is Rock Khalid. It's a pretty cool guy out of, I see, uh, Egypt. It's called One Love. No, that's, that's not Rock Khalid. When Rock Khalid comes up, I'll listen, listen to a little bit. So, um, there's certainly many factors that black males do not control that have a, a tremendous bearing on the quality of their lives, the quality of the school they attend, the kind of neighborhood they live in, whether there are jobs available or employers who will hire them, whether police officers will stop them without justification or judges will treat them fairly or even if they will be born healthy and raised in loving, supportive families. Nonetheless, there are factors that can and must exercise control over. They can and must exercise. I made this point recently to a large group of incarcerated black and Latino young men whom I was asked to address at New York City's Rikers Island, the largest penal facility in the world. Prior to my visit, I spent a great deal of time thinking about what I could possibly say that might serve as an inspiration, a source of inspiration to them. I knew the statistics two-thirds would end up back in prison in two years or less, and I know that despite their age, many of them had already experienced so much failure and rejection that in all likelihood they'd given up on the prospect of living productive lives. Still, the challenge of saying something that might inspire a few to recognize that they had the power to make different choices on how they want to live intrigued me, and I embraced the task. This is the revolution song for Egypt. He speaks it in, in Arabic first and then he speaks in, in English. So I think this would be a good minute. Only better, 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 better,